Right, so first to introduce myself, my name is Cathal Catello. I am the educational officer of the Heise campus. I've been running with the uni for about three months now and I've had an active career both in wormholes, null sec, low sec and high sec warfare before that time. So, today's class is going to be about fitting, specifically fitting 101, the most basic things you need to know before starting to fit on modules onto your ship. I can now assume that everyone is following along on the slides I've linked in lecture.euni. And if I could get a confirmation that everyone is listening, I'd be very grateful. Please put an X in the lecture.uni chat channel now. Lovely, we have about 20 people in here. That should suffice. So, I'll start with the going through the ship fitting window what skills to help fit your ship, modules to help fit your ship, the difference between Tech 1, Tech 2, Faction, Officer and Dead Space and the different meta levels. I'll also quickly go over the different module sizes, specifically about prop module sizes and tank sizes, also some gunnery. I'll be going over scripted modules, how they work, what they do and how you can use them. I'll be going over the re uh, requirements of rigs, how they can benefit your ship, both in fitting, DPS and tanks. I'll also spend quite a bit of time going over the mathematics of stacking penalties and how they work in balancing your ship fitting. And after that, we'll do a quick once over of external fitting tools, primarily EFT. Are there any questions before we begin? Going once, going twice, and we are moving on to the ship fitting window. Now the ship fitting window is split into two main components, the view uh, part and the statistics part. and more recently into a third part with the skins. I will not be going over that one today. The great circle in the middle is where you fit on all your different modules. High slots at the top, mid slots in the middle to the right, and low slots at the bottom with rigs and subsystems on the left hand side. Subsystems are a bit of a special case as they are only applicable to Tech 3 cruisers and we'll not be talking about them today in any great extent. Now, almost every ship, except for Tech 2, has three rig slots where you can fit different rigs and they all have different calibration costs. The number of remaining calibration points on your ship can be viewed on the top left-hand corner. If we continue rotating clockwise, we then come to the high slots where you fit on any or most modules that affect any ship other than your own, i.e. weapons, newts, etc. You can also see the number of hard points you have by the number of either filled or empty dots circling it. In the example, we have a ship with four turret hard points, and they are all filled with guns. It has no available missile hardpoints and no filled missile hardpoints, so you can't fit missile launchers on the specific ship viewed in the slide. Continuing to rotate clockwise, we then come to the mid slots, which contains any shield tank, any propulsion inhibitors, such as stasis webifiers, scramblers or disruptors, and any active propulsion modules, such as afterburners or micro walk drives. There are also many other things that fit in the mid slots. Continuing down to the bottom, here is where you find your low slots, which affect primarily your armor tank, 
and modules that increase the effectiveness of your weapons. Now on the bottom right hand corner you can also see the amount of CPU and power grid your ship has left and how much is used. Now these two statistics are very important when you are fitting a ship because every single module in this game requires a certain amount of CPU and power grid. So to be able to fit something onto your ship, you must have enough CPU and power grid to be able to do so. Further to the right, and if you don't see anything further to the right of this circle, you will see the sidebar where you can see statistics on your capacitor, your offense, more commonly referred to as DPS, your defense, targeting and navigational statistics. I will not be going over them in great detail today, but I will mention that DPS is pretty important. Also, under the Defense tab, you will see at the top right-hand corner of the Defense part of the window, you will see a number uh, consisting of a certain amount of HP. If you hover over it, a uh, tip will show up saying that this is your effective hit points an approximate total hit points of ship with current resistances which means that that is how many points of damage you will be able to take before your ship explodes. Now this can vary based on how many hit points your ship has in certain shield, armor and hull and how much resistance they have to certain amounts of certain types of damage. These damages are split up into EM thermal, kinetic and explosive. And the higher resistances you have, the more damage you'll be able to take. Now, are there any questions so far about the fitting window itself? Going once, going twice, and we're moving on. Let me know if I'm going too fast, guys. Now, there are certain skills you may want to train up to be able to most effectively fit your ship. These are referred to as fitting skills. The most crucial ones, the ones you will want to train up pretty quickly, are power grid management and CPU management which increase the total amount of CPU and power grid available on every single ship you sit in. So increasing those skills will mean that you have more fitting space available on your ship and you can fit on more powerful modules, thereby increasing the effectiveness of your ship. Weapon upgrades, shield upgrades, electronics upgrades, energy grid upgrades and mining upgrades all reduce the need or uh, the need of power grid or CPU of any specific modules. For example, weapon upgrades reduce the amount of CPU needed by turrets. For example, advanced weapon upgrades require weapon upgrades to level 5, so that's a bit further down the line. But it reduces power grid by turrets and is also a very important skill later in the game. All of these skills listed on this slide are very, very useful and should be trained up. No matter what ship or what game you are flying. Any questions so far about the fitting skills? Nope. Now, moving on to the different types of fitting modules. These are modules you can put on your ship to be able to get more fitting space. A coprocessor, for example, is a low slot that increases the total amount of CPU available on your ship. So if you find yourself being very low on CPU and you can't really do anything, Try fitting on a coprocessor and you may find your fit to now be effective. 
because you'll be able to fit on one size bigger guns or able to fit a micro warp drive instead of an afterburner, etc. The reactor control unit does exactly the same thing only with power grid. The micro auxiliary power core is a bit of a special case. It is suitable only for frigates and sometimes destroyers because they give you a fixed amount of power grid. For example, the standard Tech 1 micro auxiliary power core gives you 10 megawatts of power, 10 units of power grid as it were. This does not scale with size. Getting 10 mega megawatts of power onto a frigate may be a massive difference when you only have 80 or 90 already, but getting 10 extra power grid on a ship with 10,000 power grid already is not going to make much of a difference and it still takes up a whole slot. The power diagnostic system is a bit of a jack of all trades uh, fitting module as it increases the power grid output plus it also slightly increases your shield recharge and your capacitor recharge therefore it's a very popular module and it's very powerful. There are also certain rigs you can fit on your ship to increase the fitting space. The one listed on the slide here is the ancillary current router which gives a 10% bonus to power grid output on whatever ship you're putting it on which can also be very powerful. There is a similar one for CPU called overclocking. Now a general rule of thumb to keep in mind when fitting things like this on your ship is that if you need to put more than one of them on your fit is something wrong. There is something in your fitting that needs to be changed if you need more than one fitting module on. For example if you need two coprocessors for your fit to work you may want to consider redoing the whole fit instead of trying to cram it in there as it were. Right, can I now get a V in lecture.eu to make sure that everyone still is listening? Getting the different letters here, but most of them are V, good. That means I'm not completely unintelligible. Are there any questions so far about fitting modules and how they are used and what they do? Go right on ahead and type them out. By the way guys, feel free to ask questions before I ask for them. Just make sure to put your hand up first. Can I talk? Yes, you may, of course. Okay, regarding your uh, rule of thumb, do you mean one module in total or one of each kind? I generally mean one module in total. If you find yourself needing both a coprocessor and a reactor control unit, something should be changed on your fitting. Okay, thanks. Does that answer the question? Lovely. Uh, I'll ask my question here too. Um, so in my current fit, I have a micro auxiliary power core in there. However, I just noticed that when I activate it, it uses up almost as much of the power grid as it gives me as a bonus. Is that normal? The micro auxiliary power core? Yes, uh, tier one. Um, so when I deactivate it, my power grid at the moment is 8.3 out of 40.3. And when I activate it, it's 19.8 out of 51.8. So on both sides, it's like plus 10. I don't actually know I have it in here right now. I I think I've got, I got something in here that you still have, but... Yeah, the micro auxiliary power core doesn't actually require any power grid to activate. It actually provides power grid. It does, however, require quite a bit of CPU to put on. So it costs CPU to get more power grids. It's sort of a converter, as it were. Same goes for the reactor control unit and the power diagnostic system. Both of them require quite a bit of power grid. However, the coprocessor does not require any power grid. Uh, the reactor controls and power diagnostics require CPU. Sorry, misspoke there. 
and Methlug, I have no idea about what clicking sound you're referring to, but um, I'm hoping it goes away. Let me know if it doesn't. All right, any other questions? All right, moving on. Now, here's where it gets a bit complicated. Meta levels. You'll often hear somebody say this module is meta for. Every single module in this game comes with a great number of variances. For this example, we're going to use Warp Scrambler. There are 19 different kinds of Warp Scramblers. And they all have a different meta level. The Warp Scrambler 1, for example, is a meta level 0. The Warp Scrambler 2 is a meta level 5. Every Tech 2 module in this game is meta level 5. Any Tech 1 module is meta 0 through 4. Generally speaking, the higher the meta level, the better the module performs. For example, a meta 16 Warp Scrambler is better than a meta 5. Or a meta 4. Although in some very special cases you may see that meta 4 is exactly the same or even in some cases better than meta 5, most notably micro warp drives. But that are special cases and exceptions. You can pretty much get that into your head right now that any rule I give you will have exceptions. Everything in EVE has an exception. To find these meta levels, you can open information on any module. For this example, we'll be using the Warp Scrambler again. If you right click Show Info on that Warp Scrambler and go into the Variations tab, you'll get a list of all the different Warp Scramblers in the game. At the bottom of this Show Info screen, under the Variations tab, you will see a Compare button. If you click that, you will open up the Compare tool, which is very, very handy. In the Compare tool, you can compare different modules by their attributes. For example, what range does it have? How much power grid does it use? How much capacitor does it use? Etc. Etc. You can also sort by meta level, which is very handy. All these things can be checked on the left hand side, and then new columns will appear on the right hand side of the compare tool, and you can sort them by, for example, meta levels. And you can see that the meta 4 module of the Warp Scrambler is the faint Epsilon Warp Scrambler 1, which is very nearly as good as the Tech 2 one. It's also important to note that, generally speaking, although, again, of course, there are exceptions, the higher the meta level, the more expensive a module is. So, for example, the officer modules that are listed at the bottom of the slides here are very, very expensive indeed, counting in the hundreds of millions or even billions of ISK per module. For the most part, you will find yourself using Tech 1, most often Meta Level 4, or Tech 2 level modules. In the Warp Scramblers, you can see that we have four different kinds. We have Tech 1, Tech 2, Faction slash Storyline, because they're kind of the same thing, and Officer. There is one more kind of module, and that's Dead Space. These can be found in specific sites that you have to scan down throughout New Eden. And they vary in prices from a couple of hundred thousand per module to, again, in the billions of ISK per module. 
and they sort into the same meta level system as every other module in the game. Now, any questions about meta levels and how they affect price and performance? Going once, going twice. Ah, yes, to the compare tool which uh, we've just gone over. Next is module sizes. There are many different kinds of sizes for different types of modules. But generally speaking, there are five main kinds. Micro, small, medium, or extra large slash capital. Now, micro-sized modules, most notably micro shield extenders, etc., are mostly and slash only used on frigates and destroyers, and only when you can't fit the size higher, which would be small. Small, again, is what you would fit on frigates and destroyers. This also includes the 1MN propulsion modules, such as the 1MN afterburners and the 1MN micro warp drives. And thank you, Faye, for noting that Micro will be gone in the new patch, coming in about two weeks. Becoming obsolete, which means we'll have to change this slide again. Medium and 10MN modules are used on cruisers, battle cruisers, and most industrials. This includes guns. Also, for some reason, they've decided to name some medium-sized turrets heavy, which is the next size large. So they've kind of made it confusing here. Just know that, for example, heavy missiles is a medium-sized module instead of a large size module. The large ones and the 100MN propulsion modules are used on battleships and or capital ships if there is no capital size. And the capital, of course, goes only on capitals. For example, you cannot, however hard you might try, fit a capital armor repairer on a battleship. The only exception being the extra large shield boosters which fit on battleships and also some cruisers. Which leads into the next point, which is that these sizes are not necessarily restrictions. You can put small guns on a battleship, although I really don't see why you would want to. You can put a 10MN afterburner onto a destroyer, even though a destroyer technically is a 1MN size. And this can give you different benefits. It's best known as oversized prop mod. Most notable examples are 10MN afterburner destroyers that I've mentioned, and the 100MN Ishtars. The other modules that you can oversize are the tank modules, most notably shield extenders, shield boosters, armor plates, etc. Most important to note is that, yes, you can oversize things like this, but you may find yourself being short on fitting space if you do, so do so carefully. Are there any questions so far about the module sizes?
Going once, going twice, and we are moving on. Two scripted modules. Scripted modules are always med slots modules. Now these can boost either your own or a target's ability to do certain things. Sensor boosters and tracking computers are the most common ones, increasing signature resolution and targeting range and or tracking speed or optimal range for guns. Now the reason I'm mentioning these specifically is because they can be scripted to either do half of each or all of one. For example, if you have a sensor booster on your ship with a bare sensor booster, it will give half its bonus on scan resolution and half its bonus on targeting range. But if you put a scan resolution script in there, it will remove the targeting range bonus and double the scan resolution bonus, for example. Methlog, you have a question, please go ahead. Method. Yes, scripts are standalone items, but they do need to be inside a scripted module to actually do the job. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes. Can they be loaded in just like ammo, basically? They do not uh, get consumed, if that's what you're asking, but in all other ways, yes, they behave like ammunition. Thank you. And yes, I was pausing for a question. Now, like I said, each of these scripted modules, the sensor booster, the remote sensor booster, tracking computer, remote tracking computer, tracking disruptors, and remote sensor dampeners, they all have scripts in them. Because each one of these modules have two bonuses. And the scripts can either maximize one or the other while removing the one they aren't bonused for. For example, like I said, a optimal range script will then remove the scan resolution bonus, but double the optimal range bonus. That way you can alter the way the module behaves based on your situation. Such as when something moves closer to you, you no longer need the extra targeting range that a sensor booster gives you, so you swap out the script for a scan resolution so that you can target your targets quicker instead, and vice versa. Same goes for tracking computers. If you find yourself with your targets being closer to you, so you no longer need the optimal range bonus, you swap it out for a tracking uh, speed script so that you can track your speeds better and do more damage. Like I said, these scripts last indefinitely, so as long as you have one of each for your scripted modules, you'll never run out of them and they load instantaneously within one server tick, so you don't have to worry about them taking a long time to load. There is one more special case, and that's the warp disruption generator, which is only used on heavy interdictor cruisers, tech to uh, interdiction cruisers, can be scripted to act like infinite points. These modules with these scripts in are the only thing that is capable of holding down super capitals, like supercarriers or titans. But these are special cases, and those modules have only that specific rig. And without the rig, they act like a mobile warp disruption bubble.
Now, are there any questions so far about the scripted modules and how they work? Please put your hands up like you just don't care. That didn't quite work. Faye has a question, go right ahead. Gio, if I'm understanding your question right, um, they don't change automatically. The script you have in your module, it gets loaded in like ammunition, will change how that module behaves. The script will stay in there forever until you take it out, and when you take it out it gets removed within one server tick, i.e. very close to instantaneous, and the same for when you're loading it. Very good. Then we are moving on to the next slide, which is rigs. Now, the important thing to know about rigs is that they are permanent modifications of your ship. You cannot take them off without destroying them. In all other cases, they work pretty much like modules. They can increase your effectiveness in tanks, the way you do damage, the way your guns track, the way your drones behave, the way your capacitor works, or how much uh, power grid and CPU you have. You do not need any skills currently to fit on or fly ships with rigs on. However, there is a massive benefit if you train up the skills for them. Because every single rig that uh, affects something other than fitting space has a drawback. For example, a hybrid weapon rig will increase the effectiveness of your guns, but it will also increase the amount of power grid required for them to be fit on. So you will get less power grid. But if you skill up in hybrid weapon rigging, you can reduce that drawback a certain amount. So you do want to get the rigging skills up quite a bit if you are planning to fit tight fittings. Some rigs, like I mentioned, are very special. Ah, yes. Uh, Myth like, like I said, this is a relic. They do have skill requirements in Goose Marks, but they are irrelevant. They were relevant until a few months back when CCP patched it. You do not need any skills whatsoever even to fit Tech 2 rigs onto your ship. However, like you said, you still want to have those skills up because they will reduce the drawback. The drawbacks can be seen under the attributes, the amount it does, and under description. For example, the one you linked here, small projectile burst aerators, will increase your ship's projectile turret rate of fire, but it will also increase the amount of power grid used by each gun. If you skill up in projectile weapon rigging, you will get less of a penalty. You cannot completely remove the penalty, however, no matter how skilled you are. Now, all rigs have two variants, Tech 1 and Tech 2. They are produced with uh, certain salvaged materials differing for each rig. I will mention that Tech 2 rigs are produ produced by blue salvage, which is significantly more expensive than the standard salvage, which means that Tech 2 rigs are generally very, very expensive in comparison to their Tech 1 variants. For that reason, Tech 2 rigs are generally not recommended for PvP-specific ships. Now, are there any other questions pertaining to rigs and how to use them and what they do?
Going once, going twice. To the wondrous world and mathematics of stacking penalties. Excitement. Now, stacking penalties pertain to certain, um, certain modules. It affects how effective it is to put more than one module affecting the same attribute of a ship. The most common ones are the ones that increase the resistance of your ship and the ones that increase the damage done by your guns or missiles. For example, heat sinks or adaptive uh, invulnerability fields. For example, both of those are stacking penalized, as it were. Any module with a stacking penalty will show under the description tab penalty using more than one type of this module or similar modules that affect the same attributes on the ship will be penalized. Now, what this means in effect is that the more modules you put on the same ship that affect the same attributes, the less effective modules are going to be. So if you only have one module that is affecting a certain attribute, for example, if you have only one heatsink on a ship, that heatsink will give 100% of its bonus. But if you put two heatsinks on a ship, the first module will still do 100% of its bonus, but the second one will only give 86.9% of its bonus. And the third one will give 57.1, and the fourth one 28.3, and the fifth one 10.6, etc., etc. Which means that the more modules you have, the less effective your slots are going to be utilized. In general, as a rule of thumb, it is not a good idea to put more than three, maybe four modules that affect the same attributes on a ship. Now, there is one exception to this. Oh, oh. Jared Soltek had a question a bit late. Uh, rig skills, is the drawback calculated and persisted during install, or is the drawback reduced if I train the appropriate rigging skill after installing it? Yes, if you train up the uh, drawback reducing skill after fitting uh, the rig on, you will still get the benefit of the skill. So you will see it uh, getting more fitting space, for example, if we're going with the small projectile burst aerator. If you fit it on your ship and then train up projectile rigging, you will see that you then have a bit more power grid to, to play with. This goes for the same if somebody else rigs it for you and then gives it to you. No worries, Jared. Now, where was I? Uh... Yes, uh, yeah. Now, there is a bit of a special case with damage control units. Damage control units are never stacking penalized, even if they attribute resistances to your ship. This means that if you have, for example, uh, three energized adaptive uh, membranes on your ship, plus a damage control, the damage control will give 100% of its bonus, one of the uh, ENAMs, which they are more colloquially known, one of the ENAMs will give 100%, the second one will give 86.9, and the third one 57.1. Even though one might think that the damage control will give 100, and the first uh, ENAM would give 86.9, and then moving on down the line. What this means in effect is that on a PvP ship, or a ship with armor or hull resistances, it is always a good idea to put on a damage control, because they ex are exempt from the stacking penalties. No, only one damage control. You cannot fit more than one damage control on a single ship. That's why. Last thing I'm going to mention is that the way it is calculated, as in the first, the second, and the third module being affected by stacking penalties, is that 
if you have one module which gives a 20% bonus to an attribute and one module uh, giving 15% bonus to that module, the one with 20% benefit would give 100% and the one with 15% would then give 86.9%. So you always get the maximum amount. And Seamus talked about uh, modules that are also exempt from stacking penalized during the Q&A game mechanic. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Andrew LaFollette, feel free to ask questions. And sound is not dropping now, I'm waiting for that question. In rigs, it is a bit special. The drawbacks are additive, whereas the benefits are stacking penalized. So putting on rigs goes including in the fact that you generally don't want more than three, maybe four modules, including rigs, that affect the same attribute. The drawbacks, however, are additive, so it will always be, for example, if you have no skill in that particular, it will always be 10%. So again, this goes to the rule of thumb. You generally don't want more than three or maybe four modules or rigs affecting the same attribute on your ship. I hope that answered the question. Lovely. Moth, go right ahead. Feel free to speak up and mumble, by the way. Uh, yeah, could you go over that last thing you talked about, about the order of the first bonus and that, that stuff? Thanks. Yeah, okay, so I'll repeat that. The way it is calculated by first, second, third, and fourth module being affected by stacking penalties, the first one giving 100%, the second one giving 86.9, the third one giving 57.1, etc. The more effective a module is in regards to the attribute being affected, the higher up that list it's going to be. So if you have one module giving a 20% bonus to an attribute and another module giving 15% bonus to the same attribute, the module giving 20% bonus would be the first module being stacking penalized, and the second module would be the one giving 15%. So the one giving 20% bonus to an attribute, for example a thermal hardener, would then give 100% of the 20% bonus, but the second module giving 15% bonus to the same attribute, in this case thermal resistance, would then give 86.9% of those 15%. So something like 12 point something percent bonus, instead of the 15 you would expect. I hope that answered the question. Lovely. Are there any questions now pertaining to stacking penalties so far? Because I'm not done with them. Right, so in the second slide of stacking penalties, you can see an example of this in practice, working with a hurricane with a sensor booster and a signal amplifier. Now you can see how the math works in practice. If stacking penalties didn't exist, this ship would get a bonus with these three modules on. It would get a bonus of 91.41 kilometers bonus targeting range. However, since stacking penalties do exist in the game, they get reduced by a certain amount down to 89.01 kilometers. Now, I won't bother reading all of this math out loud, but I'll give you a minute or two to read over it, and if you have any questions, feel free to put your hand up.
Bryden, go right ahead. Feel free to speak up and mumble or type it out, whatever you choose. Will we be able to download the entirety of this slideshow for reference later on? Yes, they are public and they are in the slideshows of EV University server. If you go into slides.eveuniversity.org, you can get the complete list of all the slides made publicly available so far. Excellent, thank you. They are now linked in lecture.euni as well. Brent asks a question, uh, stacking penalties, do they also apply to negative e wall modifiers? Now, I will assume that you are talking about tracking disruptors and um, sensor dampeners. And yes, stacking penalties do apply to them. So the more sensor uh, dampeners you have being applied on a single ship, the less effective the next one is, etc., etc. Yes, two molasses using six dampeners on a single ship would be very ineffective. That is why you see more spread on sensor dampeners and tracking disruptors. I.e. why a molas wouldn't use uh, all its dampeners on a single ship, it would rather spread it over a range of ships. That way it gets a maximum amount of e-war per ship. Now, are there any other questions about stacking penalties? Going once, going twice, and we are moving on to external fitting tools. Now, there are two main schools of external fitting tools, the ones that, that are most commonly used. They are EFT and PIFA. They both share a key set of attributes. They can import and export fits to and from EVE. You can put in your API key to get your exact skills so you can see how your skills would affect a specific fit. And you can get DPS graphs and ex effective hit point calculations off both of them. Personally, me alone, I prefer to use EFT. I like EFT better than Pypha. However, many people prefer Pypha as Pypha is available on Apple, whereas EFT is not, unfortunately. If you want more information about EFT, I will be giving another lecture about that later on today. Adrain, go right ahead. Yep. Uh, if we download the slides, Will the links be clickable there because I noticed that they aren't here? Yes, that is simply because I prefer to have everyone on the same slide so that I know that we're all on the same page. You will be able to click through the slides on your own volition when you go into the slides.eveuniversity.org later on. Now, there are a few fits uh, available publicly on the EUNI Wikiship pages, and they are in EFT slash Pytha format, which means that you can copy them from the web page and then paste them into EFT or Pytha, seeing exactly how they would work with your skills, for example. You can also get fits off Battle Clinic, Fail Heap Channel, Fleet Up, or you can just ask someone you know, for example, your mentor, your teachers, or even your fellow students. Now, I won't be going over EFT or Pypha in any more detail today, uh, but the question Solidus asks there, is there a reason why you have a caution on Battle Clinic? Yes, and that is because Battle Clinic number one doesn't track with um, updated versions of EVE, which means that a fit may be outdated, i.e. the modules no longer exist, or the modules have changed and the fit is no longer viable, etc., etc. And Battle Clinic is also full of trolls who specifically post bad fits in order to make someone else's day miserable. 
that's just how they get their jollies off, I guess. Yeah, and generally, uh, I will say this, don't rely on a single point of information when getting fit. If you're, getting, if you're getting a fit from Battle Clinic, for example, it is generally a good idea to ask your fellow students, check how it works in EFT, ask your mentor or your teachers, ask around, see if they have any opinions. That way you can modify the fit to either work better for the specific job you're trying to do, as opposed to the, what the original poster was trying to do, and it may also help in revealing troll fits. Now, from this point on, I've now gone over all the different things you need to be aware of before you start fitting your ship, i.e. what modules you can use, uh, what uh, skills you need to have, etc., etc. I'll now be going over fitting mentality, what needs to be going through your head when you're fitting out a ship. This is where good fits get separated from bad fits, and where great fits get separated from good fits. Rule number one, specialize. Trying to fit up a ship to be okay at every job means that it's going to be crap at most of them. This is key. If you forget everything else I've said today, remember this one thing. When you're fitting up a ship, specialize its ability to do a very specific job. For example, if you're fitting up a sniper ship, fit it up for long-range damage dealing only. Don't try and fit long-range and short-range weapons on the same ship, because that means that it's generally going to be ineffective at both jobs. So the first thing you want to do is to identify what am I trying to do. When you've figured out what you're trying to do, for example, I'll use sniping as an example here, you've figured out that you want to do sniping. Then you need to choose your ship based on that ship's bonuses. For example, the Cormorant has a bonus to optimal range. So a Cormorant would be a good idea for a sniping ship, for example. Third thing you want to do is to fit your ship with modules that maximizes that ship's ability to do that job. So for example, on the sniper ship, you would fit long range modules instead of short range ones. And you would fit the weapon type it's bonused for. So in this example, that would be hybrid weapons, rail guns. The same goes with tanks. Specialize in one kind of tank, either shield or armor or speed, or hull if you're feeling special. It is much better to be awesome at doing one thing than being sort of okay at all of them. The last thing you want going through your mind is cost. If you're fitting out a ship to go out and do some PvP and you're expecting to lose it, don't fit it out with Meta 15 modules that cost 100 million Iska Pop. Fit it out with something cheap and cheery so that you can go out and do it again and again and again. If you have a ship that you know you will be using a lot and you're not expecting to lose it, then you can start fitting up more expensive things on it. For example, if you have a mission running ship. Ah, oh, yeah, sorry, Mithlug. As Adaran says, when I say isk a pop, I mean isk per unit.
Now, I'll repeat the fitting mentality one more time. There are three parts. Number one, choose what job you're trying to do. Either sniping, tanking, damage dealing, or whatever. It goes for the same for every time. Thing number two you do. Pick a ship bonus to the job you're trying to do. If you're trying to tank, pick a ship that has bonuses to tank. If you're trying to do damage, fit, pick a ship with bonuses to damage dealing, etc. Number three, fit that ship with modules that maximizes its ability to do that specific job. Those are the three things you need to know about fitting mentality. What should be going through your head when fitting up any ship, no matter what ship it is? Are there any questions about the fitting mentality? Going once, going twice, and we are moving on to fitting up tanks. Now I know this is a bit frightening with a lot of text, but in general there are well six types of tanks. Seven if you include hull tanking. I'll go through them in order. We'll start with active armor tanks. The general idea of active armor tanks is to repair any damage taken to your armor with an armor repairer, either on your own ship or on some other ship, a logistics ship. Now to do this most effectively, you want to have high resistances and energized platings on to increase the resistances on your ship. That way you increase the amount of EHP repaired per armor repairer. If you just increase your armor HP, you will find that that doesn't increase your ability to actively repair your armor. It will just increase the amount of armor you have to repair. The other kind of armor tank is a buffer armor. In a buffer armor tank, you're simply trying to maximize the amount of EF estimated hit points you can get off your armor tank. So you would fit on both energized platings or resistance modules and hardeners and or plates to increase the amount of damage you'll be able to take before you die. However, you cannot then repair that damage taken underway. So you have a set amount of EHP and the more damage you take, the closer you'll be to death and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, the same repeats itself in shield active and shield buffer tanks. The same rules apply. With active, you want high resist and you use active modules to repair that. And these active modules use capacitor. And in buffer, you're simply trying to increase the amount of effective hit points you have before you die. But shield has a third kind of tank known as passive tanking. A passive shield tank maximizes the amount of shield being naturally regenerated. You can actually get this up to a very, very viable amount of EHP per second repaired in those marks. This uses shield power relays and shield extenders and hardness to increase the amount of shield you have to reduce the time it takes for your shield to recharge and increase your resistances. The reason you may want to use shield extenders on a, on a passive tank is because shield extenders increase the maximum hit points you have in your shields, but they do not affect the shield recharge time, which means that you uh, repair more hit points per unit of time, which means that you effectively get a bigger tank. Now, shield passive is generally only used in PvE. That should be mentioned because in PvP, you'll find yourself facing more damage per second than you are able to passively recharge, although, of course, there are exceptions. 
Now the sixth kind of tank is a speed tank. Speed tanks is mostly only used on frigates and destroyers because they can move very very quickly indeed and they use this to go very close to their target, orbit them very close and move so fast that they can't be hit. The guns of the hostiles just keep missing them. It's known as a speed tank or a signature tank. It does, however, require quite a bit of real-world skill to pull off. They are also dependent on not being webbed and scrammed to slow you down, because if you are, you're most likely going to die very, very quickly indeed. The last kind of tank, the tank not mentioned here, is hull tanks, because only real men hull tank. That is because hull tanks are very difficult to pull off indeed, although they can be very powerful. Most notably, you can hull tank certain ships to be able to withstand ridiculous amount of damage, mostly Galente ships. For example, I have a mate of mine that flies a hull tanked Algos with the tank of a cruiser, which I've tried to fight and it's ridiculously hard. But they are quite hard to pull off, can be very, very skill intensive indeed, and require a bit of real world skill to pull off again, same as speed tank. And it is not recommended to try and hull tank your ship before you know exactly what you're doing. Now, are there any questions about fitting tanks so far? Solidus asks, for shield tank ships, is it a good idea to carry an armor repairer fitting outside of combat missions, not during, to use for, to avoid uh, repair costs? Yes, you can do that. However, it's not recommended to have an armor repairer fitted permanently onto a shield tank ship. But like I said, if you carry a mobile depot and you refit outside of the mission pocket or just outside station, or just refit and station and then go outside to repair is very viable and it's recommended. You can also do the same thing with hull if you're in, if you're in the position of having received hull damage. I've saved quite a few million isk by using hull repairers myself. So yes, that is a good idea. But don't do it while in combat. It should be done after combat. And like Faye Toledo says, damage controls help hull tanking immensely as they are, aside from the Bastion module, the only module that affect the resistance you have in hull. A Tech 2 damage control will give you a 60% bonus in uh, hull resistance. That, combined with uh, reinforced bulkheads, means that you can get a pretty viable hull tank off a ship. And Adrian asks, is hull structure? Yes, hull is structure. Sorry if I didn't clarify that. Any other questions so far? Going once, going twice. And we are moving on to fitting turrets. Now, the same rule applies when fitting turrets as when fitting tanks. Fit up one type of gun and one size of gun and one subsize of guns. And also one meta type of gun. Pick a range and a weapon type and a meta type and a subsize and stick with it. Be awesome at that one size and tank, tank, uh, tank weapon type, instead of being sort of okay at several of them. The main thing you need to know is that short range turrets, autocannons, blasters, pulse lasers have higher DPS, faster rates of fire, lower volley damage, shorter range, better tracking, and they require less CPU and power grid. Whereas the long range turrets, artillery, railgun, and beam lasers, have generally lower DPS, slower rate of fire, higher volley damage, longer range, 
worse tracking and they require more CPU on Power Grid to fit on. So for a newer player it is often easier to fit on a short range uh, gunnery than it is to fit on a long range. Now each class of weapon has two or three sub-sizes. For this example I'll be using the auto cannons because they are very easy to set apart. You have for the small type the 125, the 150 and the 200 millimeter subtypes or sub-sizes. The 125 having less DPS but faster tracking and less optimal range but the larger you go the more DPS the longer range but less tracking you will have. This goes across blasters and pulse lasers as well and also to railguns, artillery and beam lasers as well. Solidus asks a question here. You had trouble during the Sisters of Eve missions where some of your long range guns couldn't overcome the tank of your target. Now at that point there is two ways of overcoming that. Number one, get better skills. Number two, get a short range weaponry. Those are the two ways, the two most commonly used ways anyways, of overcoming that problem. You can also, if you were using the smallest sub-size of long-range weapons, consider going upper size, which would have more optimal range and slightly more DTS to also overcome that problem. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, uh, you overcame the problem using short-range weapons instead. Well, there is a third way. You can get help from someone else. You can run them as a fleet, as a team. That way you double your DPS effectively. Brent has a question. What if a ship has a certain amount of turret hard points and a certain amount of launcher hard points? Are those ships worth to be used? Yes. Although, I should mention that you would normally choose either to use all of the turret hard slots, hard points, or all of the launcher hard points and not mix. Although, again, of course, there are exceptions. Most notably, the Rapier, which is a Tech 2 Minmatar cruiser, which uses both missile launchers and guns on the same ship. And like Adrain, you can use drones on almost any ship, and it's almost always paying off to do so. which is why Drones 5 is one of the first skills you want to have to the maximum level to be able to fly a full flight of five drones. But I'll get to that. Are there any further questions about fitting on turrets? Going once, going twice, and we're moving on to fitting missile launchers. Now missiles are slightly simpler than turrets. There are only two major launcher classes for each size of ships. For frigates that would be light missiles and rockets, for cruisers that would be heavy missiles and heavy assault missiles. However, they do also have a third kind of launcher called the rapid launchers. They come in rapid light and rapid heavy and they fit onto cruisers and battleships respectively. There is no rapid variant for frigates. Now the rapid light launchers have the advantage of using smaller missiles. Now the reasons you want to may, may use smaller missiles is because missiles do damage based on a couple of attributes of the target ship and attributes of the missiles themselves. Most notably explosion velocity and explosion radius. The smaller the explosion radius on the missile the better it is because the explosion radius of the missile 
does damage onto the target ship depending on the target ship's signature radius. If the signature radius of the target ship is smaller than the explosion radius of the missile, you will do reduced damage, which means that it is basically pointless to shoot torpedoes at a, uh, at a frigate. You'll do almost no damage to it at all, which is kind of confusing, I know, but that's the reality of it. Mithra, you had a problem? Uh, question? Destroyer is clumped with frigates, yes, and battlecruiser is with cruiser. That is correct. One more thing I'll mention about the rapid light and rapid heavy is that although they have very good damage projection and very good damage application against smaller targets, they do have a very long reload time, 40 seconds or 35 seconds for some. I believe that got redone to 35 seconds not long ago. Which means that while you have very high burst DPS, you have a long period of time where you're not being able to do DPS to your target at all. So that needs to factor into your fitting, uh, uh, fitting considerations. It's something you need to think about. Last thing I'll mention about fitting missiles is that they do come in two different types, light missiles and rockets, like I said, for frigates, and heavy missiles and heavy assault missiles for cruisers. Now, they come in long-range and short-range variants, light missiles and heavy missiles being long-range and rockets and heavy assault missiles being short-range. Now, there is a very big difference in the ranges between them. Whereas heavy missiles can have ranges up to 70 kilometers, heavy assault missiles can be as low as 16 kilometers. So when in doubt, it is generally recommended to fit the longer range version so that you can always apply some damage to your target. Otherwise, you're going to be basically a duck in a pond, not being able to do anything, which is very frustrating indeed, let me tell you. Now, are there, uh, just as I was about to say, Andrein, go right ahead. Feel free to speak up and mumble as well. So when you're using, like, the long-range rockets, uh, is the general strategy just to, like, stay far away and shoot from far away? Yes, that is correct. It is known colloquially as kiting. Staying far away from your target and being able to hit him while him not being able to hit you. If you have one pilot uh, piloting with heavy missiles and the other pilot with heavy assault missiles, the one with heavy missiles would usually win in a duel because the one with heavy missiles could just move out of range of the other pilot's heavy assault missiles while still being able to do damage himself. Now, we are moving on then to fitting, oh, never mind, James has a question, how does the range on rapid light missiles compare to the other two categories? It goes sort of in between them. A rapid or heavy missile launcher will go right in between uh, cruise missiles and torpedoes in range, so it would have mid-level uh, ranges. It is a bit weird because the range of missiles are dependent on the missile being shot, not by the launcher. So if you're using a light missile launcher and a rapid light missile launcher right next to each other, they would have pretty much exactly the same effective range. Unless their ship is bonus to one of them, but not the other, of course. Are there any other questions about missile launchers and missiles in general? No, then we are moving on to propulsion modules. Now there are two different kinds of propulsion modules, actually three, but I'm just going to go over two of them now. It's afterburner and micro warp drive. Afterburners increase your speed by a set amount, 112.5 for the Meta 1, up to 159 for some of the faction ones. Now afterburners increase your speed 
baseline. They take up quite some capacitor, but not a ridiculous amount, so it's fairly easy to keep stack cap stable while using them. Microwave drives increase your speed a lot more, but when they are active, they increase your signature radius by a ridiculous amount, 500% for the uh, lowest meta ones, although some of the uh, higher level ones don't do quite as badly. And they also reduce your maximum amount of capacitor total, which means that a permanent portion of your capacitor is going to be taken up by a microwave drive, even if it's not active which means that it's a lot harder to be cap stable with a microwave drive than an afterburner. Also, microwave drives can be shut down by a hostile warp scrambling you. That is very important to note. Adrian has a question. You're really being active. I'm liking that. Uh, my current um, Tristan, I have an uh, afterburner and a micro warp drive. However, when I want to switch from the micro warp drive to the afterburner, for example, when I'm getting close to an enemy, I first have to wait for the micro warp drive to properly stop before I can activate the afterburner. I've not really been able to figure out why that is. That is because every ship in this game is limited to one propulsion module being active at one time. While you can fit on uh, two of them like you have, you can only have one of them active at a time. This is to stop people from putting two micro drives on, for example. Which would make the ships ridiculously quick. I see, thank you. Check and also but I want to add that propulsion modules needs to finish a uh, so-called cycle and then you can switch to other propulsion module. Yes, uh, like he said. Now, what you have done, however, is to dual prop your ship and it can be very powerful, like you said, to be able to get into a target quickly, you use the micro warp drive and then you switch to the afterburner because your micro warp drive will most likely be shut down by a scrambler thus increasing your speed and ensuring that you still have an effective speed tank, which is a very good thing. Which was what I'm, I was going to talk about next, so you kind of cut me to the quick there. Uh, you have another question? You go right ahead. Adorain? Uh No, that uh, arm raising is still the one from before. I don't oh. have another one. Oh, okay. That's fine. Now, are there any other questions about fitting propulsion modules? No. Then we are moving on to the last slide of this lecture. Modules to watch out for. Modules that seem very good but may not be. There are three of them. The first I'll talk about is the warp core stabilizer. Now, on the face of it, this looks like a very powerful module. That, indeed, it reduces your chance to be warp disrupted or warp scrambled, i.e. if you have a warp core stabilizer on your ship, even if you're being warp disrupted, you can still warp away, which seems very powerful indeed. However, they have massive drawbacks a 50% reduction in targeting range and a 50% reduction in the scan resolution, which means that in effect you're pretty much going to be unable to effectively do combat. However, if you're not planning to do combat with a ship, it could still be a good idea to fit something uh, like this on. Fitting warp core stabilizers onto haulers, for example, may be a good idea because you're not planning to use that hauler for using in combat. It is not meant to shoot back, it is meant to run away. Second module is the cloaking device. Now, cloaking devices again seem very powerful on the face of it, being able to completely hide your ship from both descan, overview and visual in space. However, while they are active, they significantly reduce your speed, 
which means that you won't be able to go anywhere, and you cannot target anything else, which means that any other module you have will be offline, including tanks. And while they are offline, they still have a severe penalty to scan resolution, which means that they will limit your ability to do combat, although not as severely as a warp core stabilizers. You can, however, use them in uh, scouting ships, for example, which you may want to keep uh, on, uh, on a hostile gate, for example, whilst remaining hidden. Uh, Gio asks a question, cloaking does not hide you from local? No, it doesn't, but it does hide you from D-scan, and it does hide you from visual identification and from the overview. Adrian asks, can you warp with them activated? No, you cannot. The only uh, cloaking device that can do that is the Tech2 Covert Ops cloaking device. And the Covert Ops cloaking device does not have many of the penalties that the Tech1 or uh, standard Tech2 one does. The Covert Ops cloaking device that Faye just linked, you will see, doesn't have any penalties to scan resolution, for example. And it has a much lower, um, actually no, restriction to speed while active, which means that you're still able to move around fairly well while using it. However, the Covert Ops cloaking device can only be fit on certain ships, such as stealth bombers. Or if uh, it has a certain subsystem, you can also fit them onto uh, um, Tech 3 cruisers. And as uh, Tech says, Cloak also hides you from combat scanners, combat scanner probes. Basically, the only place you are visible with a Cloak active is in the local channel. Meslig, you had a question, go right ahead. Okay, that's fine. Now, the last module is the Inertia Stabilizer. Now, this one's a bit more tricky because it seems to be very powerful. It has a very high bonus to maneuverability, which means that you'll be able to align uh, much quicker. However, there is another module called Nanofiber Internal Structure, which does the same job, but better. So you will almost always want to fit nanofibers onto your ship instead of an inertial stabilizer. The only exception being non-AFK high-sec haulers. Because they will be able to align slightly quicker because the nanofibers do take away some of your cargo space. Now, at this point, I'm going to open up the floor for a general Q&A before we end the lecture. This, this is the end of the slides. I have no more things to tell you. So at this point, you're free to ask any questions you want, and I will do my very best to answer them. Methleg, yes, go right ahead. <laughs> uh, Solidus, there is not going to be a test on this. Mithlung asks, is it worth getting advanced weapon upgrades since it requires weapon upgrades 5? Yes, it is worth. But it, like you said, it is quite a bit down the line. When you get to be a few months old, it may be time to start considering getting advanced weapon upgrades because, especially on many of the Tech 2 higher level fits, it is required. Are there any other questions pertaining to fitting in general? Feel free to speak up. Ah, yes, Adrain, uh, I did mention that there is a third propulsion module, and that is the micro jump drive. What the micro jump drive does, it, it blinks you 100 kilometers forward in whatever direction you are moving. 
and it can only be fit on two battleships and there is quite recently been added a medium micro jump drive which can fit on certain battle cruisers. It requires a specific skill to be able to fit on called micro jump drive operation and it can be shut down by micro uh, uh, by uh, warp scramblers. However, it can be a very powerful module indeed. Uh, Tech Sharex and uh, module placement in relation to thermodynamics is a bit more advanced. I will be mentioning that in my Fitting 102 lecture, which will be going up at 2100. So if you want to uh, know more about that, please uh, participate in that lecture. Now, unless there are any other questions whatsoever, I will thank you for listening and please ask you for feedback because that's the only way I can improve these classes. You can give me feedback either through a personal email directly to me or by replying onto the class announcement link that I just linked there. And yes, this class is recorded and I will see if I can get it uploaded to the class library. I will be ending the recording at this time. So you can all breathe uh, easily again. So thank you all for listening.